what what is yeah. going bro he's got a sentient backpack a, pi- a sentient <laughs> pimp cane and a sentient thunderbird Indeed. like too many too Indeed. many things have got opinions he's got a drum he's got a grumpy stormbird or something he like <laughs> he's so he grumpy not sentient <laughs> <laughs> he's he's got a malevolent teacup, and if you put the wrong kind of liquids in it, if you put like you know like if you put Bailey's in, it, in, it just yeah. it spits it at you in your eyes. The yeah. non sentient <laughs> poop knife. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Law Crimes. Today we'll take you on a journey from beginner to expert in Warhammer Law. On this episode, we are going to be covering the Clone Lord, the disgusting but yet beautiful Fabius Bile. And now I will hand it over to my illustrious co-worker, my brother in arms Andy, to helm our beginner section. Take it away, Andy. Okay, well, today we are talking about a particularly um, peculiar, I think is a good way to describe him, character in the Warhammer 40k universe. Um, Very unique amongst Astartes uh, for several reasons, but I suppose we'll start with the basics. Like, who is Fabius or Fabius Bile? Some people say Fabius, some people say Fabius. I'm never really sure the correct uh, pronunciation myself, but... I think the, the correct one is Fabius. But I, f- I find Fabius sounds nicer. Something about it. I don't know. But either way. Um, so Fabius Bile hails from the third legion of the Adeptus Custod- uh, Astartes, not Custodes. <laughs> and he was the lieutenant commander and chief apothecary of the third legion. A um, little bit of uh, n- information about Fabius. During the Horus heresy, prior to the emperor's children's fall to chaos, Fabius was experimenting on how to make the soldiers in the legion stronger and he was one of probably the main reason why they fell so swiftly the i think it's a fair point to say he was one of the main reasons if not the main reason oh yeah that they fell to chaos i mean a big nudge to give you an idea yeah i mean (laughs) he he made eidolon capable of like screaming his enemies to death he did all sorts of wacky Mm -hmm. experiments on not just the astartes but also his primarch fulgrim um and of all the of, of all the characters in the lore, he is the most I I say prolific apothecary, the the medic class of Astartes of, of the soldiers. Um and what's interesting about Fabius is he although he is a pawn of chaos to an extent, he is not driven by power, he's not driven by a want to to wage war. His entire modus operandi is he is in a, a never-ending quest to find knowledge and to create and to experiment. So what's interesting about Fabius is, for example, everything is a means to an end. He doesn't like the ruinous powers as such. He doesn't like demons. He doesn't like chaos. He believes that chaos and the warp is is, is something you can explain scientifically he doesn't believe that there are such things as gods. He doesn't believe that, you know, that 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 worshipping these, quote, gods in his own tongue is worthwhile because they're just, he, he he's, I don't know what the word would be to describe them. They're not quite apparitions, but he just sees them as like the machinations of humanity. Um, almost like and, forces and, of nature. Yeah. And, yeah. and he doesn't have that same zealous streak at his uh, brothers in arms from the Third Legion do. But he was... He was arguably the most uh, liked of his legion by Fulgrim. Arguably. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's a bit, um, I say, particularly with his appearance as well, for the, the okay. beautiful man, the gorgeous man that is Fulgrim. I don't think one could say uh, Fabius was made in his image. <laughs> maybe mm-hmm. maybe, but, maybe but, not. But he always respected him as like, I, I feel like, I'm, I'm sure I've, I've read, like, I've been lis- uh, reading the, uh, listening to the uh, Fabius Bile books recently, and there's all these mentions of, you know, he always liked you the most because, you know, you were keeping things, you know, you, you were doing the most for the Legion. You had your head on properly, unlike, <laughs> unlike, 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 unlike um, 
you know. Uh, yeah, but, well, but he he's in, he, he's always been. There, there, there's lots of mentions in, in, for example, the 41st millennium where people are saying, oh, the Legion shattered. You're the only one who can bring us back from the brink and make us a fragment of our former glory. Because more than anyone else, because he wasn't so decadent as the other emperor's children, he he was able to kind of uh, to collar them and reel them in a little bit. Um, Fabius has done a lot of weird stuff over the 40 version of the what, 10, thousand plus years. That is the biggest um, understatement I think anybody has ever said in the Warhammer yeah, law. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you have anything in mind that you would say was, was particularly weird that you can think of? I think the, uh, for if you are new to Warhammer particularly, uh, Fabius as an apothecary, you think, oh, healer, you know, you know, it's not like in other, I guess, fantasy settings where like the healer's usually like the calm good guy. Vabius is definitely a neutral mm. evil, shall we say? Yeah. Mm. And the parts where he would I think um I was reading the Lucius book and he just straight up is just experimenting and putting like alien DNA in things, just being like, Why are you doing that? Why not? is the biggest <laughs> answer yeah. always. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. yeah. When, when you uh, when you brought up I was, when you brought up he was like the medic. And then when he said, uh, you brought up Idol on Andy, I can't help but imagine him as the medic from Team Fortress 2. He's just shoving like baboon baby. hearts at the people. Let's <laughs> go back. Oh, oh that, that is cursed. Man. He actually so awesome. was um, the person who saved Nathaniel Garrow from dying uh, when he, he lost his leg, who was the person who treated his wounds. Fabius Bar was the first person to get to him and treat his leg. And if, in a weird way, if it wasn't for Fabius, maybe the loyalist war effort wouldn't have really gone off as it. Oh, here comes a law crime. Oh, no. <laughs> the police outside. You can't, uh, yeah, can't, can't you know, fix you know, any no. legs in the law. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, how dare you utter this heresy that maybe Fabius was integral to the events leading to the, you know, the loyalist war effort? Anyway, um, so yeah, he he's he's actually a really good medic. He's he's you know he's he's so good at being a medic. He regularly performs surgeries on himself. Um, Yikes! He, he has Hardcore. cloned him, his body, and so to say that Fabius that is alive in the forty first millennium is alive isn't really true. He's a clone of his former self with like an imprinted version of his mind. So Fabius has been dead a long time, but. There's so many copies of him. Every time he dies, he jumps into a new body. He has fail safes in place. So if someone betrays him, because, you know, chaos guys aren't the most trustworthy of guys in the 41st millennium. That's They're shocking. The absolute yeah. horrible yeah. accusation guys, there. I cannot uh, believe it. My mind. <laughs> you know, inflated skin. Not really the guys you'd leave your your house keys with. But like, yeah. <laughs> um, so anytime he's he's he get he even gets a sniff of betrayal. And he gets stabbed in the back. Doesn't matter. He's got a bot. He's got a new body on the ship he's currently at, wherever he is, that just activates, and then he's like, "Plomp! Oh, I'm alive again. No worries." Mm -hmm. Kind of like budget Necrons, um, yeah. which he, there is even an exchange with him and Trazin the Infinite, where he's like, "Oh, you're doing a primitive version of what we do," and he's like, "Go away. I don't like Xenos." And you know, fun times with with two of the arc. Arguably the two smartest people in the the galaxy, or some of the smartest people in the galaxy. You know, can't can't do too much. I enjoyed their the like uh, the galaxy is the emperor. I really enjoyed their conversation uh, between Trezin, uh, the Infinite, and Fabius because it's such a they obviously they're in both in different realms. So if you are like new and you don't know who uh, Trezin is, Trezin is a Necron overlord, obviously an un kind of a semi undead. Uh, egyptian uh metal dude and fabius is obviously the i guess they're kind of the epitome of what is a machine genius and in a way like obviously the genius of the flesh if you know what i mean so they kind of represent two pillars of uh different viewpoints but they obviously i think that there's a brilliant point isn't it where they said why i think fabius asked uh trezin like why are we even talking and then trezin says because i was curious and then fabius goes yeah. mm, yes i understand I like yes 
Mm-hmm. Well, that, that curiosity they're, often gets them in trouble as well. Indeed. <laughs> they're, they're no Eldred, but I guess they're okay. Yeah, yeah. Well. Oh, elves. Yeah, you had to bring it down to elves, didn't they? I knew it was coming. Yeah, I'm not going to support a traitor. They're, but they're I'm no, not going to let that slide either. They're, they're, no, they're, no, they're no techless. No, oh, no. here we go. Has to bring yeah. it back to elves. Yeah. You know, be sick yeah, everywhere. The true, yeah, the true Phoenix. Can. Anyway, to be fair, then. That, all right, well, we got to yeah. move on from what Eli just said. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, but to, to, to do a 180 and get back to the light of the Emperor um, so Fabius has also been trying to replicate a lot of stuff that the Emperor first did uh, he was very much inspired by oh the Emperor is a really good scientist I want to kind of I want to make better things than he did which has had mixed results uh, he has his own little uh, bunch of what he calls children who are these genetically created abominations which he 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 designed specifically to kill Astartes and to supplant humanity as like the next stage of human evolution with these weird, you know, uh, new not, men. Not, they're, they're almost yeah. childlike with the way they approach the world. Um, and he's he's got all these different uh, kind of generations of children where he's been tinkering away and making improvements. He's got all sorts of weird and wonderful panoplies of war and technologies. Um, I don't want to give too much away. Uh, he has a consortium, which is a group of Astartes for, who are apothecaries of various traitor legions who are drawn to him because they 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 know he's a smart guy and they want to learn from him. So he's got like apprentices from like all the traitor legions who who are part of his like inner circle that he gathers occasionally and says, OK, what kind of Geneva Convention breaking experiments can we do today, class? And they go, well, let's let's think about it. And uh, yeah, very very interesting motivations as far as a character goes. Um, I think that's a fairly broad way of going into Fabius Bile as a character. Did we have any questions? What I've already mentioned already. I think I have a slight one, which is about how. I think in a lot of the books as well, it doesn't uh, necessarily, there's no like crystallizing, I think, moment of when, because uh, a lot of times when you meet Fabius Bard in Warhammer, you kind of, mm. you know, we're like either, you know, we're the Imperium usually, and we kind of, you just like, oh, look, there's that kind of slightly balding um, <laughs> apothecary. I bet he's not too bad. And it's then you, Frankenstein, get him. Yeah. And then you just, <laughs> it's one of those things where like his darkness and his kind of, roguish uh ro- roguish rogue roguility is that even a word his roguishness is like um revealed to us later on and his just renegadeness renegadeness uh that's a great his, one yeah his, his roguish gilliminess <laughs> Rog- roguish gilliminess um but there's no like uh kind of yeah it's, it's like one of those things where i never know if he was always like that particularly in the Horus Heresy Legion, or if that's something he became. I wondered if that was a. I think, I we'll think over time that. he got jaded. That's the way I read it, at least. Like there, there's mm-hmm. stuff in like his his uh, trilogy of books where people have said, you know, you could have led the Third Legion back to glory. You could have done this. You could have done that. And he 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 has several times where he goes, "We were idiots for for doing the heresy. We never would have won, and we were fools. And look what happened to the uh, and its point. And he's he's very much like ah." Oh well, I just need his his main motivation in those books is I need to do my great works before I die, and that's all that matters. He doesn't care about surviving. He doesn't care about living forever or immortality. He's just like I need to do the things that I think are important, and then when I've done those, I can die and be happy. And that's an interesting that's an interesting motivation considering the rest of his kind of uh, camp Ilk. of the rogues gallery are like I want to be the ruler of the galaxy and i want to live forever and eat baby hearts and it's like okay oh god yeah <laughs> yeah exactly chaos Ugh. it's kind of cool even because even outside of chaos a lot of factions 40k are just like i just want to survive the next five minutes and fabius mm-hmm. seems to just be like as long as i get what i gotta get done i'm, I'm good yeah. i can die and also he dies on a regular basis like no nah, no worries it's okay yeah. don't worry we just hop bodies real quick don't mind me <laughs> uh, copy paste new fabius done i think that's uh no that's, i think that's the only big one i had really uh colin colin you got anything you anything you need to like really get off your chest about fabius 
is uh, it's a question that I feel like might be answered more uh, in the expert section, but I, I'll ask it now anyways. And if it is, you can just say we'll get to it. Is uh, there's I'm guessing there seems to be a lot of the a lot of parallels between him and the emperor. It just seems yeah. like Fabius, uh, mm-hmm. the emperor has like three morals lines he doesn't cross, and Fabius has zero. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, is have they ever have they ever worked together? Because that would seem like that'd be not that I know natural. Hmm. I don't think they have. I don't think so. But he has some opinions on the emperor's work. Oh well, yeah. There's there's, there's that kind of semi-famous thing where he was like. He's an egalitarian, Fabius. He's like, why didn't the Emperor make women into Astartes? That's a waste of resources. And you're like, oh, he would have made, like, female space marines? Because, like, some of his, quote, children who are the uh, Astartes killers are female warriors. And so he doesn't, he just goes, oh, are they strong? Okay, I'll pick any of them. That I'll just breed. You guys can keep breeding through genetic mutations and stuff and get stronger and they're there. And he's got, like, his favored child who, uh, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but she's like, the best at killing and he's like ah oh. i think he's not really affectionate towards the idea him. of like, the idea of him being like gender neutral is in like you think it's a nice <laughs> but like because obviously it's fabius bile so it's like i respect all people all people are materials yeah. <laughs> everyone can be under my scalp everyone is equally care. material like, yeah, yeah it's, it's not the way we hope it to be <laughs> it's like a no. oh, bit dark bit dark he was this close he was this close to being an ally oh <laughs> deep down our hearts are all the same and i would like to look at all of them <laughs> i think that's all Shall questions we... covered i think we'll head on to the expert section then hit us hit uh, us with the good law eli fabius bile is the greatest apothecary and perhaps the most ingenious human being to ever live he is the primogenitor spider clone lord and man flayer It was largely because of Fabius that the Third Legion fell so far beyond recognition during the Horus Heresy, yet he created monstrous warriors who were enhanced far beyond a regular space marine. In fact, in his opinion, perhaps improved upon as a space marine. Many mad scientists and crazed geniuses have come from humble and at times even uncorrupted beginnings. Fabius, though, had a glint of madness and psychopathy at the beginning of his very youth. This would slowly shape him into one of the most influential men of the Imperium, and perhaps the entire galaxy. So, Fabius was born and raised upon Terra in northern Europa. He learned the ways of flesh crafting from a very young age. Teachers showed him the ways of creating life, and Fabius reveled in discovery. One of his very first and greatest being the ability to replace pain with pleasure, which we will see be a very big Yo, what? About <laughs> the, the Third Legion, they love it. So, That's to answer your question earlier, how <laughs> yes, Fabius was messed up from the very beginning, essentially. I'd say, how young is he, dog? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, what? Yeah. Was that, was that standard wow. procedure? Like, you know, the emperor's <laughs> children to get shot instead of screaming in pain, he busts a nut. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at the end of the heresy, like literally, though. I mean, I, I suppose Fabius was when that started to change. It was like we are, we are perfect, and we are good boys. And then I know there was the whole thing with the Third Legion where their gene stores got like decimated by a virus, mm-hmm. yeah, and we'll so that. yeah, we, oh yeah, let's, let's do it, let's do it. <laughs> uh, so before departing as part of the tithe to the Space Marine Legions, Fabius was taught one last lesson by his mentor. That no matter how much flesh is changed, the soul itself will never change. And the soul is what matters. You would think it'd be a little wholesome, but compared to a situation, it probably was not. Uh, probably not from the nice teacher that was. It is. Yes. Probably, yeah, not from the teacher that was like teaching him <laughs> to feel pleasure from pain. <laughs> the soul never changes, looks mysteriously into his eyes. <laughs> That's a, bit, that's a bit too far. <laughs> and Astartes of your age will notice that your body is changing. <laughs> okay, okay. When a when a when an Astartes and a lady love each other very oh, much, yeah. very much, no, there, that's, that's not, there is that's nothing not. happening there. Move on. <laughs> Unless they're right. a space wolf. Yep. Uh. So Fabius would later find himself in the Third Legion, the Emperor's children, the best Legion here. <laughs> He would truly begin his destiny. 
The third was a struggling yet noble group at the time, barely holding on to life due to a disastrous event involving their gene seed. The Emperor recently theorized a solution to the quickly deteriorating gene stock of his space marines, but for further research, each legion was required to send their gene seed reserves to Luna. And the Emperor's children gene stock would disappear, under very mysterious circumstances. Ooh. We will find out where these gene stock went later in the video. Yeah. Ooh. Interesting. Far worse than this, though, the gene stores on Terra would be corrupted by a terrible virus, leading to the eradication of the entire reserve of the Emperor's children genes. This is when Fabius came in. He would come to the grim realization that the gene blights had not ended on Terra, but survived to taint the Legion itself. And, as time went on, more of his brothers would perish. Bile would become highly desensitized in the face of loss. Already making him more of a psychopath, or I guess a sociopath mm. in this sense. Bit of a nihilist. So, so, yeah, he's everything bad. But he's, he has reasons. Uh, there was nothing Fabius could do but catalog the infected gene seed as he watched the Legion crumble around him. His first breakthrough was barely that. He discovered a means to test for the contagion in his living brothers, which would appear to be the time of his fall, or pushing over the edge. Before the Legion had even found Fulgrim, Fabius was on the path to damnation. Yet like many of his brothers who would later fall, his descent was largely determined by unfortunate position and situation. He did what he had to do. Orders came in to the Emperor's children demanding that all tainted gene seed be destroyed. This included the gene seed of the living. So began the isolation and madness of Fabius. It was his job to test the brothers for this flaw, and his job to decide who died. He became the judge, jury, and executioner, a butcher. All of his comrades became nothing but biomatter to him, flesh to be cut open and studied. He was truly hated. Fabius was already an estranged and eccentric individual, and all this simply pushed him into the realm of the mad genius. One of his greatest, most iconic mechanical creations would arise from this time, and I might say this wrong, but it was the Chirurgeon. Or chirurgeon. Chirurgeon. Hmm. There is no correct that, pronunciation. It's, 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 it's chirurgeon. I always, it was, I, it was, I always thought it was chirurgeon. Nah, nah. It's, it's Char Charlie for short. <laughs> Char it's Charlie. We'll call it Charlie for now. It's on. The, <laughs> the, the chirurgeon. Char is very. Oh. It's a very very cool, and evolving invention. Uh, at the time, very weird. Yes, this spider-like machine was simply used and as a as an assistant in his work. But over the millennia, it would grow a sentience of its own and become far more malign. Uh, Andy, do you have anything else special to oh, say about this? I have a lot of notes about the Chirurgeon. So, <laughs> um, Charlie, so Charlie. Charlie. <laughs> so, so, yeah, Fabius kind of invented it and tweaked it over the years. But as soon as he started to reside in the Eye of Terror, it kind of, it kind of gained sentience. Just a little bit, like not too much, but it, it 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 can think, it can and it can, and it became a an amalgamation of technology and warp sorcery. So this thing is charged with the warp. So in the forty first millennium, by dint of wearing it, Fabius is pumped with Icor, which strengthens him and makes him stronger than a regular Astartes. Uh, he can also use the Chirurgeon to inject his allies. But the results are a bit hit and miss. Sometimes, oh. temporarily, they get really strong. Other times, their metabolism skyrockets and they basically like eat themselves from within. Ooh. There's all sorts of weird things that happens with this backpack he wears. Um, it's a. Backpack. This is what he uses. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 like, <laughs> it's like a tech marine backpack almost. Yeah, like oh. a backpack from Dora with the face on it. I think that's yeah. <laughs> Dora <laughs> Explorer, but she makes you some warehouse from the inside. High virgin model, you know. Um, and, and and this is what he uses to do when he's awake. He uses this to do surgeries on himself. So oh, of course, that's how he does it. He has this thing that can think, and it's kind of warp crazy. It's got ten thousand years of his own tweaks and messing around. So that's how he performs surgeries on himself. Um, weird thing about this thing. At one point, it went missing. And Fabius was like, yo, um, consortium, my children, um, can't find my backpack. 
and you go, look, <laughs> we got a problem. Finds <laughs> it, <laughs> finds it, and it's been it's given birth to a bunch of eggs. Mm, I don't like Whoa, that. Yeah. Whoa, where's like this that going? Really, and man? the eggs have hatched mini chirurgeons. And Bio was really kind of like, that's weird. And he really, <laughs> really wanted to like dissect it and go, what the hell is going on in here? But he he didn't in the end because his his train of thought was, I have few enough allies as it is. This thing literally helps me do surgery on myself. I'm not going to betray that trust. That's a weird thing, right? That's like a, one of, that's weird. That's weird. Yo, like, you uh, go ahead, go ahead, Colin. So I guess I, I mean, I get it. Like again, like we said, he's a chaos marine. You gotta take what friends he can get, <laughs> even if it's a weird backpack thing. I'm not saying it's ideal. In fact, it's probably about as far as you can get from ideal. But mm. trust your backpack. It's just, it's just the what, like the wrong. Sentence. Yeah. <laughs> and then again, this is this is coming from a guy who literally has a lab coat made of human skin. Yes. So like, yeah, le- swings and roundabouts. Like, yeah, my my backpack's given birth to a bunch of baby backpacks, but at the same time, I'm wearing Darren, and <laughs> I'm wearing <laughs> Darren. And, you know, <laughs> there's a little bit of Frank over here. You know, like not the most um, stable place to. He, he's 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 not good, good at our interior. He's not good at interior decoration, but he's very good at making coats. God, that's weird. That is weird. It's quite neat. It's growing. <laughs> of course, you like it. That's weird. Me, that's weird. You like it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it is. It's, it's growing flesh in the most recent time, and some of his lackeys found it eating things, even though it doesn't, oh. doesn't really eat. But, yes. Anyways. Let's go back to the 30th millennium for a little bit. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about Fabius calling the taint from the Emperor's Children Legion. And he does successfully. So once the taint is finally purged from the Legion, Fabius would add his own genes to the records as he tied up the loose ends. This would bring the realization that all along he had been infected. It is unconfirmed mm-hmm. how he did it, but Fabius's record would come out as clean. And his only friend would be found tainted. It is thought then that in an act of incredible betrayal, Bile would swap his record with this space marine named Lycaon, one of the tiny few who he could call friend. This man would then become a reanimated thrall within Bile's lab. So he got to keep his friend in the end. Uh, Yo, in one way or another. Like carrying him his dad. He's like, I keep you in a tank. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, so now, sad. Yeah, it is too bad. Mm. No one really liked him after that. Well, no one ever really liked him, except for that one guy. And <laughs> well, that one guy in the cleaner who doesn't come yeah. around anymore. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Julius Caesar one liked him for a while until he was just like obsessed with heavy metal, and it's just like, yeah. oh, no one talks to Julian anymore or Julius. <laughs> yep. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, when the Legion finally found Fulgrim, Fabius was the only apothecary left, uh, and the Legion numbered a meager 200. He had single-handedly saved the Legion from the Blight, but this feat would be shadowed by the innumerable men he had slaughtered in the process. Fabius would later become one of the extremely few of the 200 that still live to this day. Hmm. Bulgrim would see a cynicism in Fabius that he thought negatively of, but aside from this, he treated the apothecary with great respect and even stood up for him. He would... He told everyone to stop calling him Spider, which Hmm. was the nickname he got because he wore the crown. like it. Mm-hmm. So Fulgrim was actually nice to him uh, and saw potential in him, I suppose. Um, and as a result, he would offer Fabius many promotions of rank, but Fabius would always decline because rank meant nothing to him. And that often, relationship would be important later on as well. Mm-hmm. Mm. He often ignored the chain of command completely and operated almost as a separate entity, locked away in his laboratories. Despite this, he was an incredibly skilled teacher, and the apothecaries of the Third would become amongst the best in the Imperium. This skill at teaching would never leave Fabius, and is a large component of his success today. In his time studying mutants of an enemy force, Fulgrim would discover the chilling reality of Fabius' beliefs. That the Space Marines are imperfect, the Emperor's work is fallible, and it is his job to succeed where the Emperor had failed. 
Despite his complaints and opinions, the Spider would later become Chief Apothecary and Lieutenant Commander of the Third, bringing him an even larger degree of autonomy. Guy can basically do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't take much to get him to do whatever he wants. He's doing Fulgrim's plastic surgery. Like, you yeah. do not mess <laughs> with Fabia Spile. Indeed. Too important. But where does he put the plastic? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These are the big questions we need to know. <laughs> Yeah. Some truths and some questions are best left answered. <laughs> so wherever oh, and revolved. however it fits. Okay. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> so, now we arrive at Laren, the beginning of the end for the Emperor's children. In the conflict against the Lair race, Fabius would discover the prospect and intrigue of genetic alteration, finding that many of the aliens were altered in ways to fit in their theater of war or place in society. To Fabius, this means of improvement was a step towards perfection, and while Fulgrim would be appalled at first, he would eventually allow the Apothecary to improve upon his battle brothers. This obsession with evolution and progress would only proliferate within the mad scientists throughout the millennia. Working night and day, Fabius would tirelessly begin experimentations to enhance the Legion, and when the day came, Lord Commander Eidolon would be the first to feel the scalpel of the spider. Unfortunately for him, it was not revealed that Zeno's flesh and genetics were to be implanted in this horrid work until he was already strapped to the table. Yikes. Would, yeah, he was not mm. happy. But he well, let it happen in the end because he didn't have a choice. But mm. Yeah. Uh, Eidolon would later awake stronger and further tainted than before. His newfound powers were later displayed against the Eldar as he emitted an ear-splitting, nerve-shredding shriek mm -hmm. that could literally destroy swaths, swaths of enemies and even armored transports. Sorry, and that's Colin. One of the re again, it's <laughs> another little piece of like the loyalist war effort where uh, Eidolon's fighting the um, the Chaos like Slaneshi war singer, and no one can kill her. And they're like, "Ah, oh, we got to get close." And then Saul Tarvitz goes of Eidolon to get her. And then he, while they're in this weird like psychic bubble, he just screams at her, and she disintegrates. And Saul's a bit like. A, that was pretty a, weird. That's a bit mm. <laughs> And so again, like Fabius being involved in the very opening stages of the Horus Heresy. Well, I, uh, actions. Well, I particularly, I remember because reading some of the uh, Fulgrim books, the part I like as well is Fulgrim, although if you do uh, end up reading a lot of Horus Heresy books, it feels like very fast that Fulgrim falls. But mm. in... Um, if they remember, like it's after like two hundred years of the Great Crusades, it's a long time. But the the uh, part I think I enjoy about it with like the Fabius, the part where um, Fulgrim comes to Fabius and they're starting to experiment on their own legion. Fabius essentially hasn't changed the entire time. He was always that person. It's just like Fulgrim at this point, you know, two, basically after two hundred years, he goes, you know. I will not let Xenos DNA be part of me. And Fabius just goes, but you might fail the emperor if you're not perfect. And he <laughs> just goes, oh. just goes, damn, you got a point there. <laughs> so well, maybe, maybe in, in that, in that kind of vein, uh, is it right if I slip in a quick quote for Colin to read? Oh, oh of course. Good. I'm excited for this one. Okay. So this, this, I think this, this ties in with what Hal was saying about like the ends justify the means with, with, uh, Fabius. So here you go, Colin. All right. Let me, uh, let me let me get my my dramatic voice reading. <clears throat> if a man dedicates his life to good deeds and the welfare of others, he will die unthanked and unremembered. If he exercises his genius, bringing misery and death to billions, his name will echo down through the millennia for a hundred lifetimes. Infamy is always more preferable to ignominy. Mm. Oof, that sounds like yeah. obvious. That's a That's fabulous. Just a little bit haunting <laughs> there, isn't it? Charming this sounds like a game well. show. That sounds like Fabius. Yeah. <laughs> and Fabius does change eventually, not mm. necessarily for the better, but his uh, his direction and motives change a bit after the Horus Heresy, I'd say. They evolve in yeah. the, all the wrong ways. <laughs> yeah, for the most part. He, I think actually I'd say 41st millennium Fabius might actually maybe be a slightly better person than 30k Fabius. Really? Yeah, he's more repentant. He's more like he's more sorry for some of the things he's done, and he's like I, he he's full of regrets. 
mm-hmm. to an extent. But we'll we'll get there eventually. So, Fabius's greatest discovery and undoing of the chapter would once again be the linking of pain and pleasure receptors within Astartes. He knew how to do it with humans, but not with Astartes until now. Mm. Uh, he would create a superior Osmodula, making space marine bones more virtually indestructible than they already were. Uh, the sonic shriek spoken of earlier was the result of an altered Betcher's gland using layering mm. hormones. These were only a few of his many improvements to the space marines under his scalpel. And I mean, if the Legion didn't turn into a bunch of crazed maniacs, he probably <laughs> could have done a pretty good job at making a formidable force. It's always cool whenever yeah. someone brings up the Betcher's gland. I feel like it doesn't happen mm-hmm. often enough. Yeah, I know. We want more Betcher's gland videos <laughs> and films on Netflix. Shout, Shout out to my Betcher's gland people. Out there. <laughs> Shout look, out to Betcher's gland. <laughs> I know it's silly, but you spit acid. That's metal it's, as yeah, hell. It's, it's, yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, he did come to his probably the most important breakthrough at the time for, well, ruining the Legion. Uh, it would involve splicing Xenos DNA to create a drug which would greatly increased legionaries' already incredible metabolism and strength. Mm, yeah. And under the influence of the Lair Blade, Fulgrim would give the apothecary permission to distribute the drug en masse to the entire legion. Bad times. So, Mr. Marius Verosian, 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 oh, I think it's Verosian, yeah. Yes. Uh, would be another of Fabius's great works, as he became the very first Blessed Noise Marine. Not blessed at the time, I guess, but Still, uh, they were called Cacophoni back then. And Fabius is somewhat as a, of a father to all Cacophoni, at least the original ones. And all of the ones in the 40, 41st millennium are either originals that he made or they're just improvements upon what he made or versions of what he made. So that's a little cool connection he has with all of the noise mm-hmm. marines he sees in 40K. He even recognizes one as his own work when he meets a little coven of them. But that's later. So... Mm. Marius is given similar shriek as Eidolon, as well as other auditory enhancements. After many surgeries, Marius would descend into barely contained madness, an unfortunate fate of much of the third. His flesh was a prison, and every sensation was ramped up to 1,000%. Slight ire felt as burning hot rage, and the smallest pleasure became an orgasmic sensation of bliss. Yo, yes. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Almost as sensitive as the Eldar are. Yeah. Mm. Uh, no, bring it back. <laughs> with the blessings of Slanesh and the apothecary's knife, you are always left wanting more, never getting enough. Many of these enhancements would become widespread throughout the Legion, and Fabius worked tirelessly to continue his craft. By the time of the Dropsite Massacre, the Space Marines of the Third were unrecognizable monsters. Mouths were permanently distended, eyes stitched open, speakers and amplifiers were stuffed into flesh, ears were split open, and those are only the small things. So, Yikes. While, while the Lair Temple was a great tragedy and unwilling corruption to the Dark Prince, Fabius gave the Legion right into Slanesh's hands. Upon Istvan V, Bio would create his infamous coat of flesh from the fallen of this horde conflict. It was around this time that he developed the Cyclops Needler, which, mm. Andy, would you like to tell Ooh. us about that? So, let's talk about the Cyclops Needler briefly. So, the Cyclops Needler is basically like a very big dart gun, and it contains Cyclops serums on... Usually, it, it contains three Cyclops serums... One containing hypervenom, one hallucinogens, and one pyroclasmites. Um, basically, Fabius used this as a as like a way to be like, it's inevitable I'm going to be fighting Astartes. But while I'm doing that, I can glean some information and do some experiments. So he uses this to like, when he shoots his enemies, not only does he kill them, but he gets to observe how they die, and he gets to experiment with the toxins he creates. So like, he's a, he's a bit of an overachiever. He's like, I'm not going to just kill you. I'm going to kind of take advantage of this opportunity to like further my own scientific intrigue and curiosity. So it's a bit messed up. Um, it was actually developed when he analyzed genetic material from the blanks or nulls of the Imperium, and it's because of this, because of the Noll's ability to 
um, stifle psychic powers or warp powers. It's particularly effective when warding off and fighting demons. Uh, and pretty much, Fab, as far as I can tell, Fabius is pretty much the only one who still uses one because it's he developed it. He only the Third Legion had it. They're kind of decimated as it is, more or less. Like I'm not seeing any Primaris with Zyklos needlers. That's all I'm saying. Yet, yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny that he has like a like every piece of equipment he's got is just like cursed like it's just you know like like, mm -hmm. like you know dora the backpack with children like <laughs> yeah, with, with, yeah. with needles. i and don't want to jump the gun eli but there is there is another important piece we could talk no. about no <laughs> there is does he there does he is. own i wonder if he owns anything ordinary like a rubik's cube or something <laughs> even his hairbrush is cursed i'm saying yeah. <laughs> no, he's got a cursed hairbrush with a thousand souls in it which when he combs his hair makes sure it doesn't get in his eyes mm. like he's got all sorts of weird stuff yes he has not so, gotten his third piece of equipment quite yet though so we'll wait We'll have to wait a little bit for that. Mm. But yes, the the needler is quite awesome. Is that all you wanted to say? I presume. Uh pretty much. Unless you have anything else to add. Uh well, there was one moment uh, where we see that he's actually created serums that affect demons. Oh which yeah. You didn't wow. think would be a thing. He shoots the de uh, the needler at a keeper of secrets, I believe it was, mm. and it like basically boils and bubbles and eats itself alive and. Doesn't he get reborn? It has a go at him, and he's like, "I hate you because you shot me with that thing last time." Yeah, I think so. <laughs> there's like, like all wow. these like there's like Fabius and his retinue in, in I think it's the second book, and they're like being confronted by a, a demon, great a great demon, mm -hmm. and they're like, "Why have you got such animosity to each other?" He's like, "I merely shot him with the needler, and he like melted, and blah, blah, blah. he's not really gotten over it." And you're like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> he's, he's, a, do what do. he's a slash demon. I thought it would turn him on. <laughs> <laughs> like, damn checks notes brian let it go <laughs> forgive and forget Duh. was it keeper of secrets brian it's just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. okay so the legion now on the way to further conquests fabius would find himself in a dire situation the flesh blight had finally caught up with him uh, and he reckoned only a single year remained within his case of flesh Using elixirs of his making, he would hide his condition, but it still seeped through. After years of surgery upon himself, his skin had become a map of stitches. His eyes darkened, and he grew gaunt. This must have been a possible point in which he began his legacy of the Clone Lord, as he researched ways to survive. In fact, he likely performed just as many surgeries on himself as he did his brothers, Fabius would eventually uh, develop a way of transferring his consciousness to a new body. But the Blights always remained, unchangeable and forever clinging to his DNA. A this weird was... parallel to the Necrons in a weird way. Like, he, Indeed. no matter what you do, it's in your genes now. It's yes. not going away. And there's, yeah. And I think he's later... I, well, I'll talk about that later. That's later in this. <laughs> Never mind. So Spoilers. Uh, he didn't do this out of fear of death or a need of self-preservation. He simply worked to stay alive so that his work could continue uh, and one day be complete. He had not yet gained the mindset that he has today, but Fabius would eventually become almost a father to the future, a benefactor for his new lineage of creation. More on that later. While this happened, Fulgrim had become fully possessed by the demon within the Lair Blade. He would execute Eidolon for questioning him, but Fabius would later reattach the Lord Commander's head to a new body. More importantly, Lucius would see through the lies of Fulgrim's demon and call a meeting of brothers to exorcise it. With the help of Julius, Marius, and Lucius, the spider is able to devise a way to rid Fulgrim of the entity, or theoretically at least. So genius and twisted was the apothecary that he gleans the ability to inflict unimaginable pain upon the godlike physiology of an actual Primarch. Which might not sound crazy, but it's very impressive. Even for like Fulgrim as well, like um uh for like people who uh know just just of the Primarch, a lot of them had unique abilities, and it's said that I think Fulgrim, out of all of them. Like his like specialty was that he had very very uh, quick healing, didn't he? Compared to a lot of his brothers, there's like a part where it's mentioned they were like carving, I think, a ritual 
scar or something into him and he had to try and concentrate to not let his healing mm. out heal the, <laughs> out heal the wound makes sense with his transformation into a big like snake creature it's like yeah the shedding skin parable like yeah he he literally transformed because he's so quick at healing and he mm. shed his Ooh. prior self to to be reborn oh, as nice. whatever he is now <laughs> like that Harvey Fulgham <laughs> <laughs> He's not listening. <laughs> Heresy! Heres- Where is the Inquisition? Get the Inquisition. Awesome. I love to hear, hear a voice in the corner just going, like, uh, love you too, bro. Like, it's just like, <laughs> what? The, the Fabius books are very nice because you actually get to hear about Fulgrim for the first time in a billion years mm. of Warhammer novels of 40k. Yeah. Because they just, like, kind of forgot that he existed and don't talk about him. So, the incredible feat of causing all this pain to the Primarch would actually bring Fulgrim back to his flesh. Uh, Fulgrim claims that he could have done it all along, but it's kind of... uh, It's hard to tell if he's just saying that. A bit arrogant, Uh, isn't he? He could have said, you know, a bit of a teenager sometimes. You know, I totally could have done it, I swear. (laughs) It might have just been like that. The possession of Fulgrim is a very sad, sad moment, though. So Ray Fulgrim is is the best horse heresy book. Fulgrim? Indeed. It's pretty good, but it's very good. Uh, to me, all of it's tragic. <laughs> it's very, it's very tragic. Yeah. That's why it's so good. Eldred's in that one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he gets his butt kicked. No, uh, well, no. Uh, Eldred himself no. doesn't, but his buddies, his friends do. <laughs> he uses the anyways jo- the Joe Star secret technique. <laughs> 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 okay, con odio. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, with that out of the way, Fabius returned to his work. Uh, and would retrieve the genetic data crystal given to Horus from Alpharius Omegon. Uh, this data was corrupted by the twin Primarchs because they didn't want to give good stuff to Horus, obviously, but they likely underestimated Fabius's genius. Uh, this crystal was the one stolen from Deliverance, which was given to Korax by the Emperor himself, which pretty much allowed them to create something akin to primaris marines yeah they, they made production. raptors they yeah. like they they were able to quickly create astartes and they were like this is going really well then the alpha legion snuck in and they were like yeah, it's <laughs> big yeah, let's big alpha legion big alpha legion w good, yeah. good and stuff and then they made made the raven guard into monsters Demon and they were like oh, into yeah, actual awesome. ravens it was awesome yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah the alpha legion completely ruined that for them but anyways using the crystal and the information he could get from it even if it was small and progenoid glands of fallen marines, Bile would devise the secrets of the Emperor himself. As stated before, he resurrected Eidolon, and he would also create his first warrior beasts, naming them the Tarata. They were the result of limbs and genetics from multiple different species combined and attached onto a body. So they were very... uh, not pretty. It conjures an image, doesn't it? It Just just (laughs) a mess. Just an absolute mess. Yeah, they're howling monstrosities, uh, each highly unique in some malformed way. This would be the beginning of yet another of his great paths, eventually evolving into his project of new men millennia later. His lab would be destroyed with the destruction of the Andronius, or sorry, Andronicus, which was just the ship that he was on. I think it was Eidolon's ship. Um, yeah, it's the it's the uh, flagship. No, is it the flagship? No, it's not the flagship, but it was like his main ship at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but some of his work was not lost. Two of his Tourette remained, which happened to be some of his original works. They were both once legionaries of the Imperial Fists, whose lives were now a constant waking nightmare. Mm. Sadly for Bile, these two monsters would retain a glimmer of themselves and destroy much of his gene- genetic samples in a fire. But after this setback, he would begin research on the genetic knowledge given to Korax with the goal of creating clones of the Primarchs. Mm. Incubation caskets lied in secret, each containing a Primarch project, the most important at the time, containing Horus himself. Uh, during the Siege of Terra, the Emperor's children would completely lose themselves, as we know, to debauchery and madness, at least for a time. Due to what Fabius claims to be an epiphany, he left Terra shortly before the traitor's defeat, which would cast him as a traitor to the Legion, abandoning them at their time of retreat when he was needed most. Mm. Fulgrim never forgave him for this. Fabius saw the futility in their efforts, and while he never disagreed or regretted the choice of betrayal to the Emperor, he might have not agreed with the whole way that they did it, but he did believe in 
like he didn't believe in the emperor i guess he you mm. know what i mean maybe you uh, saw him like a rival in a way yeah well i i, I mean with the whole his whole bitterness with um the, the end of the horus heresy i've got a pretty good quote here if that helps mm. yes um mm. how would you like to read this one absolutely hit me with it i'll try not to uh ruin it shall we say <laughs> <laughs> this is about like the end of the Horus Heresy, his bitterness, and like just not liking the ruinous powers in general. This won't be a Fabius Vile voice, but this will be me. <laughs> Let's just say. Aww. Victory slipped through our fingers the moment Horus chose to reach into the dark and something reached back. We sacrificed our ambitions on the altar of his hubris. And when he fell, he dragged us all down inexorably with him. And not just Horus, Fulgrim as well, and Angron, Magnus, Lorgar. There, Peter. <laughs> the gods you worship are nothing, say lies, hidden behind masks of folklore and superstition. Interdimensional cancers, their mindless hunger confused for sentience among the lost and the damned. He wasn't yeah, happy yeah. about it. Yeah, no, he's definitely not. Um, definitely a bit smug, I have to say. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit like you know, pr primitives. You know, what I mean, a bit. <laughs> I mean, he's part of him is right. They probably could have won the heresy if they didn't become so corrupted by chaos. You just work uh, together. Yes, Lorgar was probably like literally the only guy who benefited at all from the ruinous powers, but uh, everyone else got kind of screwed. What a guy that yeah. was. As much as I love chaos, as much as I'm a big chaos guy, <laughs> gotta admit, they definitely kind of screwed us on beating the Emperor. We should have won. What a race, swell, what a swell gentleman, Lord God, though. We can agree, <laughs> can't we? I, I like Lorgar. The gentleman actually, and the scholar. I actually like Lorgar. I like how flawed he I like how flawed uh, he is. Fulgrim, Ooh. same to me as like with Fulgrim as well. Fulgrim is a very enjoyable primark because he's so deeply flawed mm -hmm. as a character he's so just like riddled with insecurity which obviously let's be honest we can all relate <laughs> so uh so he um just like i find him real for real <laughs> <laughs> you're a bit too deep there man a bit too deep <laughs> i suppose we'll talk about the primarchs in more videos so, definitely yes yeah he left the traders uh and they were not happy with him Fabius, Fabius was not completely separated from the Legion quite yet, though. It is rumored that many of the Terran popula population were taken as prisoners and given to bile. In Oof. an act of pure evil, the spider would process these civilians into chemicals to be ingested. Mm. So horrid were Bile's acts that Vulcan, Primarch of the Salamanders, vowed to bring him to justice. Now, the Salamanders would hunt Fabius during the scouring as the spider's warband grew ever larger. Bile giving his services to many desperate planetary overlords. Genetic corruption and degradation followed wherever the Clone Lord went. As he provided defenders with fast-acting enhancements, legions of clones, and far worse. Through the spider's web, the salamanders tracked Fabius, their fury driving them past any other tasks. They ignored a large amount of distress calls, actually, and they kind of just sped through everything just to kill Fabius. And that's yes. saying something for the salamanders who are like, oh, the cat's up the tree. We'll help you. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about it. Yeah, and they're like, nope, we cannot help you. More important things yeah. to do. That is a deaf con. Gotta swat a spider. Yeah. Yep. So, upon the planet of Arden 9, uh, that by which by all my planet fall upon to aid a rebellious governor, the apothecary gave this man grand and horrible enhancements to his troops in exchange for the harvest of genetic material. This is where the salamanders would finally catch up to him, and every one of his labs up on the planet were put to the torch. Fabius would escape, though, sorry Vulcan, releasing all of his mutant creations upon the 18th Legion and fleeing on his hidden ship. In a flash of lights, the vessel's warp drives lit, and he was gone. Uh, damaged, the ship would slowly drift towards the Eye of Terror until eventually landing upon a demon world. Once inhabited by the Eldar, this, would be, this world would be known as Urum and would eventually become his main headquarters. There's a nice Space Marine W for all the Eldar haters. Oh, no. I was going to say that. There was no W. He's scrounging <laughs> betters. Ooh, he's in someone else's better house. Uh, well, we can thank the Eldar for our nice cozy eye of terror, I suppose. 
Oof. Yeah. Big oof on that one. <laughs> yeah, I got nothing for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Crawfords did no wrong. That's what I have to say to that one. Uh, no, Exodites did no wrong. Do you know what I'm imagining? Just very. This is a completely rogue thought, but it's. Mm-hmm. You ever see in uh, the UK, there are some programs with usually a bald guy who's like, I'm here on crime invasion. And, and I'm just imagining a little documentary where it's like, here we find Fabius. And like, he had to recreate the story of how he just breaks in, yeah. him looking through the Eldar windows and just like, <laughs> and he breaks in. Jeez, <laughs> like, that's funny. Oh, Fabius man. Biles confirmed what? in your walls. Yeah, literally. <laughs> Why are the walls vibrating and flashy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. Jeez>. okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> despite his earlier abandonment, uh, many would still flock to Bile, and he slowly amassed one of the largest warbands of Emperor's children to date. Sadly, though, this would be one of the last few times the Third had any glint of unification. The remnants of the Legion were, would plunder the other traitor worlds to maintain their upkeep of slaves, because uh, their slave attrition rate was... Uh, unsurprisingly very large <laughs> they ran yeah. out of them very quickly oh their their, their extracurricular activities they weren't <laughs> exactly nice to them were they yeah they <laughs> have like volleyball and other fun sports except like the volleyball is the slave and he's like crumpled up into the volleyball the yeah, together, not, you know? go, they were demonetized let's just say that. they were demonetized <laughs> yeah <laughs> actually if one of one of my favorite creations uh favorite uh, demonetized rip mm. but in in the one of the fabius books he goes to talk to the Radiant King, uh, which I guess we'll talk about later. But he sits mm. upon a throne, which is made out of two human beings stitched together. And they are forced to always... They're twins, and they always look at each other, but I think their eyes were also oh. plucked out. He also has oh. a like an organ that when he presses a button, uh, it's, it's also made out of people. And when he presses <laughs> the button, one of the people emits a certain pitch of scream, and so he plays music on his... Organ of Yo, that's what he plays. Too much. Fabius what didn't even make those either. That was uh, what part of his consortium? One of his, one of the bros. What oh, one of the? <laughs> Out weekend with the boys <laughs> making yeah, an well, organ. Question: Question. What oh. like, like Colin and Hal and Eli? What do you reckon he like? They play what music? If you were to pick a song, oh, that would be fitting. David Bowie through the fire. <laughs> <and the flame. laughs> A dragon I'd like to see that. <laughs> Starman. It has to be Starman because I think it fits mm. really well. Starman <laughs> waiting in the sky. Can't sing it, obviously. Uh, uh, YouTube. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, we better be, we better get back on track here. Um, <laughs> so, they plundered worlds for slaves. Um, and Fabius would actually rise to become a very great commander in this time as mm. the Legion... Uh, unified he wasn't him. doing space dust <laughs> yeah the only he was like the only well sane he's is not going, the right word down, everyone. he's down, the only on. he's the only sane guy left in the means that he wasn't like drug he's addicted wearing a, and he's wearing a jacket made of human skin <laughs> and he's the sane one like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this gave them strength in their most disastrous hour his greatest scheme uh, of that time, though, would begin with the plan to steal Horus's body from the Sons of Horus fortress known as Lupercalios. Mm. So Fabius led an assault, unleashing the third upon the 16th, and would successfully come into possession of the body and begin his work. Mm-hmm. He would reunite the legions. They would, be a, they would be led by a new leader, one not blinded by the gods, one with a real sense of purpose. Fabius would recreate Horus as he was meant to be. Yet, even for the lawless and debauched Chaos Space Marines, cloning a Space Marine was too far. It was pure heresy, even for these guys. Cloning and a Primark. Cloning a Primark was on a whole nother level of madness. Horus yeah. Reborn would be the end to the Legion Wars, and would give them a mortal leader who could leave the Immaterium without the pull of the gods, because... Uh, now all the Primarchs who are demons are under the influence of the Chaos Gods, and they're not going to be as powerful outside of the warp as they are in real space, I suppose. Basically, I, Clone Horus has a really good credit score, and there's yeah. no, you know, debt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but this didn't matter to the Renegades. An alliance was formed by multiple space marines of different legions. They actually, a bunch of people put aside their differences because of how bad they thought mm. this was going to be. Um, and they even got Abaddon in line. Yeah. 
to be buddies. And he was like, check out my cool museum, bruh. And you're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> can, you stop, can you stop messing around, yeah. Abaddon? Come on. And so it was, it was a Thousand Sons guy and an Abaddon and then a bunch of other dudes. But mm. the Thousand Sons was pretty important. Oh, because yeah. it led an assault of incredible destruction upon oh, the Third yeah. Legion's world known as Harmony, which Fabius uh, was on at the time. A two-kilometer, eight-megaton ship filled with warheads was psychically flung at the surface, obliterating the capital Jesus. city and yeah. nearly everything and it was, else. And it was towed by the fa- the Thousand Sun. Basically, was like, I'm just going to like sit on the bridge and like psychically tow this massive thing mm-hmm. through like our travel to the planet, and then just like yeah. lob it at them. Uh, what's his name though oh. yo look at that um, swirl was it when you throw an american football what's it called look at that spiral <laughs> 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 yo check out my spiral <laughs> just launches a spiral spiral so uh fabius had to partake in the evacuation obviously but uh his ship was pretty much his lab at the time so it wasn't like a big deal but his ship was boarded by the alliance of traders including abaddon uh, they actually had thought Bile's experiments would take years, if not decades, to even find a glimmer of success. What they saw, though, proved them utterly wrong. The chief mm-hmm. apothecary had done it. Vats upon vats lined the ship, each containing some form of horrifying malformed clone primark. Some, though, were not as bad as others. Regardless, as Fabius approached the invaders and parlayed with them, Abaddon would order his forces to open fire and destroy the abominations that lay before them. There was one, though, that they did not see in the room. The greatest feat of bioengineering the galaxy had seen since the time of the Emperor and perhaps the Empires of old. A perfectly cloned Horus Lupercal, untouched Mm. by the warp, uncorrupted by the gods. He would slaughter the Space Marines, yet when he confronted Abaddon, the new War Master would prove his rightful place. In one of the few moments of good writing for what is supposed to be the arch enemy of man, Abaddon <laughs> caught Worldbreaker as Horus swung it down. He held it in place with his talon and crumpled it in his grip, then sinking his gauntlet into the false Horus's chest. This would allow wow. Fabius time to escape, but he would never forgive Abaddon for his reckless, foolish act of pride. And he kills him with his own talon, the talon Indeed. of Horus. And that's why when Very he... Cool. Yeah, that's why when he's like, "Hey, look, I've killed this, 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 this thing. It killed Horus again, Highmarks, well, yeah. the second Highmark, uh, second Horus, and it wounded the Emperor. Like, yeah, and, and, and it killed well. Sangi. Like, yeah, yeah, this is a pretty like, and every death makes it kind of more tainted and more mm-hmm. evil. And I found I think, the name of the Thousand Sun. It was Iskandor Kion, the King Breaker from the Thousand Suns. Is it? Sons. Is that the guy who is in the Black Legion? Novels? yeah he's like yeah, the one who yeah. like kind of really growled everyone and, and was like horus stop showing us all you're showing off from i went to this place and i killed a big thing he's like yeah yeah i don't care black legion what's up with that let's let's form let's form a band a band of warriors if you will um yeah those are awesome books so the beginning really of Wayne's world. <laughs> Howland of horus was one of my first few books into 40k mm. and i loved it yeah those are really cool characters too. It has nothing to do with Fabius Vile, but still, he's. I think it's he's cool, a, and he's like a Thousand Sons assassin kind of guy, if I remember correctly. We'll have a video on him one day, definitely. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anyways. I think that. Oh, just very Sorry. quickly, I was going to yeah. mention because Fabius, when he clones uh, this Horus, so this is implied to be like the the Siege of Terror failed like centuries ago. Yeah. And. Horus has not been seen, you know, Horus a corpse. <laughs> so mm-hmm. Horus, yeah. Horus got crumped. Well, he's not even a corpse, he's <laughs> like, not even dust. He just doesn't have, he's not here anymore. He's gone. Wait, yeah. he's, um, it's implied, well, it's implied that Fabius, even though he clones Horus, there's something not quite right with this Horus, mm. is it? Because I think it's in, generally implied that the Emperor literally destroyed Horus's soul. Yeah. So this, this Horus is just like, he's like the physical clone of yeah. Horus, but he's not like, as powerful as like the true it's like, it's like that song it's like isn't it ironic when you you need a fork but you've only got a spoon oh that's Horus <laughs> yeah <laughs> when you really need a war master and you just got this yeah and Sport. I mean I mean like Abaddon killed him so obviously if your son can kill the Primarch then it's probably not the best Primarch right but not not I perfect mean, clone it was as close as you could get at the time he does make a perfect clone eventually though which we'll talk about later, and it makes me very sad to talk about. But oh. um, this this act of destroying harmony 
would lead to the breaking of the Third Legion as they all scattered, fleeing their now-destroyed world. It was also the beginning of the Black Legion and the reign of Abaddon as War Master of Chaos. But we're not talking about Abaddon today. Many, we will eventually, I hope, even though everyone hates him, but whatever. Uh, many would blame Fabius for the scattering of the Legion, and in a sense it was his fault. Um, but Fulgrim would even place a bounty on the Chief Apothecary's head, yet none have ever claimed it. Fabius was widely hated or desired. Whoever did not wish him dead wished him in chains for their own benefits. His services, though, were still widely needed, as they were still the greatest anyone could offer. So Bile was not completely lost or defeated. And the apothecaries themselves were a very dying breed in the uh, Chaos of the Legions. So yeah. any apothecary they get was a win, but Fabius was the apothecary. Um, but he was largely needed in the creation of space marines, obviously, and the recovering of gene seed from fallen brothers. He created a shaky and influential deal with the forces of chaos, uh, space marines, not the gods, uh, which he agreed to share his secrets with the many legions, yet he would never be shackled or dedicated to one. It is largely due to Fabius that the Long War still exists. Uh, Queen Spore of the Dark Mechanicum would allow Bile the resources to rebuild his Medicaid equipment. Over the millennia, he would create what is now known as the Consortium, a large group of apothecaries who would seek out or follow the spider due to his genius. Upon Urm, they would reside within Fabius's great palace. Uh, Andy, do you have anything to say about the fellows? Ooh, um, about the bros? Well, bro, the bros of the Apothecarian. Uh, I've got a, a kind of a, a list of all the different folks from the, uh, the Consortium. Uh, are you guys interested in hearing about the main figures of such. I feel like we're going to get more cursed as the list goes down. Like, is well, it? It's not too bad. It's just, it's more like a weird rose gallery. So, That's like, starting off, <laughs> we lay it, lay it on us, lay it okay, on so, us. Okay. So, so first we've got like I think probably like the equivalent of Fabius's uh, like lieutenant is Arian Zorzi, who is a world eater's apothecary, um, very skilled fighter. Um, he. He reckons he's overcome the insanity of the butcher's nails, but he still hears the voices of the people he killed, so not too sure about that. But he's kind of like his uh, Fabius's enforcer. Like it's pretty reliable to have a ten thousand year old world eater as your like bodyguard, you know, and especially one who has a strange uh, resistance to the butcher's nails, shall we say? Uh, Korag Sin is a Death Guard apothecary who is one of Callus Typhon's Grave Wardens. Um, fun fact about him, he he has a pet called Pazuz. How and fun is a, this? Well, <laughs> Pazuz is like this... He's sorry, big. Colin. I just said, what kind of pet are we talking about? Yeah, like... Well, <laughs> where's this going? The nice, he, the nice cuddly kind. Well, he's, he's described as a hulking beast that could, like, rip anything's throat out. But... And it spits acid, but he slide. enjoys playing and serves a both both Singer's guardian and pet. So he's like like the consortium like throwing him bones, and he comes and like play fetch my weird hulking creature of doom, and that's quite fun. Uh, and yeah, Korag Cor Singh, he's like, he's part he he wears like a diseased suit of Terminator armor. Um, Fabius doesn't like him much, um, but he was he was very helpful when. Abius was trying to transfer um, basically his brain into a new clone body. So, you know, he has his uses. Um, where's uh, my favorite? My favorite is um, Simiskis. Yeah, Simiskis Flay is an iron warrior um, apothecary. And he was in exile and he took a vow of silence. And in the, uh, I think it's the first book. Um, which I think is is the first book Clone Lord do you like, or is that the second book? Uh, first book Primogenitor. is Primogenitor. First book is Primogenitor. Which I think it's the first book. Bit. Yeah. Um, he, um, he, 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 the whole book, he doesn't say anything, and he, he just kind of like. But there, there, there's another character called um, Oleander, Oleander Co, who is an Emperor's Children apothecary who looks up to. Fabius as part of his own he's like the only one in the consortium from the Empress Children and he's always looked up to Fabius as like um his mentor and he he like Oleander served under Bile for a while 
then he left and then he came back and he came back because he basically wants fabius to lead the third legion as like their new like war like their equivalent of war master and he kind of orchestrates the whole first book is like him trying to bring him back as like spiders as like um like he's like take charge of it and we won't say what happens in that regard if, if well Eli oh, I'm gonna. Oh, okay, well, Eli will say. It. I mean, but either way, and, and like Oleander, when when things are the, the cogs are in gear and in motion, um, Samiskis is the first one to like stand with Oleander and say like he puts his hand on his shoulder and kind of nods and is like and he's, he does like that Lord of the Rings thing where he's like, "Who will take the ring to Mordor?" The equivalent, and Samiskis is the first who's like, "Yeah, I'll stand with you," and he he gets killed. And before he dies, he says his last words to um, Oleander. And it's like, oh, he had like... Tomiskis was my favorite because he had like a kind of honorableness. And even though he had a vile silence, he, he also had like a good heart, as weird as that is to sound from a traitor. He seemed um, like a nice guy. What do you say, like, clean, yeah. my, clear, clear my search history or something? <laughs> <laughs> um, Brother, clear my search history and then just die. Yeah. And, and there's a few others. There's, like, Scarlet Grim Far, who's the Sons of War, is Apothecary. He was a reaver for Abaddon. Um, but, you know, I, I, I like to finish it on the Samiskis because he was my favorite character mm-hmm. from the books, at least from the Consortium. Yes. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Uh, small note to mention that I haven't said yet. Uh, Fabius loves music, especially orchestral, yeah. oh. classical music. And he can, he can often be heard listening to symphonies of old as he works. Um, he has Eldari music and some of the hey. oldest hair music. And sometimes he even listens to Becca Kinska's Blessed. Becca Kinska, yeah. Uh, the oh. lady who ruined the Third Legion. Thanks. <laughs> the cough colony. <laughs> Good job, lady. Now I do have a question yeah. about that. Mm-hmm. Because you know Warhammer is quite a ways into the future. Do you think it'd be a big stretch to say that classical music would include death metal? As <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, we're in a classic maybe. period. Maybe. I don't know. I, I feel I like mean, there's like it, a it does say of symphonies. It does say symphonies. Uh, so I think you would count it as like actual classical music. Yeah, that's I fair. just. I, I, I just like picture him. I picture him listening to things I mean, like Filthy Frank or something. Oh, I can, I can, I can <laughs> imagine. Classics. I can imagine the world eaters being big fans of Cannibal Corpse, and mm-hmm. then like uh, Thousand Sons are big Opeth fans, and you know uh, everyone's got their own thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think Empress Children are like Britney because it's Britney. <laughs> <laughs> I, always, I always listen to. Yeah, they, they like baby metal. They like baby metal. My Empress Children army. Yeah, they all. I guess we can't. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> yeah, I almost said it. Girlfriend is the best Empress Children song by Avril Lavigne. It's, it's great. Also, Anyways, a yes, it just is. A I, I love you, Avril Lavigne. I love you. That's the official stance of law crimes. <laughs> we are big fans of Avril Lavigne. <laughs> and we'd like to come out and confess now. Avril, you're welcome to the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the well, second legion loves sponsor us and that's why we don't hear about them anymore <laughs> <laughs> okay so so uh urm would become home to legions of mutants created by the clone lord and his consortium they would see fabius as the great benefactor a uh, god actually uh mm-hmm. even though bile at the time saw them as nothing they would come to call him potter mutatus which I don't actually know what it means, but it's something. Is that works. Harry Potter reference again? No, no, I, I mean the second I is must swear. be mutation. It may, is it, is it I, like it's like father mutation? mutation mutation or yeah. something like that? If I had to guess, you're an apothecary, Potter. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> just I'm a We've what? done that twice now on Law. Yeah, we we oh, have. Gosh, we we are always bringing part. back the Harry Potter references. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so over the years. Uh, Fabius would eventually come to show some form of compassion and care for his mutants mm. in some sense. He does say uh, at one point that he doesn't care if they l- mm. live at the time, but he cares about them being in the future. So he mm. says uh, something along the lines of he'll kill one to save ten in the future, he'll kill a million to save a billion, he'll kill a billion to save a trillion type of things. Uh, so I think he more cares about but they simply progress. He like, doesn't care oh, about they individuals. Are the yes, but, but I mean, there are there are some moments where he's 
very nice. There, there were tender moments with him and his favorite. Yeah. I can't remember her name, but his favorite like Gigori. child. That's another. Yes. Is that the one he calls we'll his daughter? A little bit. Yeah. Oh, bad. sorry, Melisand, Melisine. Yeah. Is that the yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, he's a. Uh, I find that he's obviously a. It's like very similar to when he begun with his own legion, isn't it? He was willing to mm-hmm. cull so many just to save the greater. If you know what I mean, he doesn't care yeah. about the individual. Which I guess is like George a, Lucas. It's like po- poetry; they rhyme, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <yeah>. Wow! <laughs> wow! Or, wow! For today's Fabius, uh, they're known as Vatborn, and they aid him in his work, usually acting as assistants in his labs. Uh, he enjoys speaking to them quite a lot, although it is unsure how much they understand, but they certainly always listen. The books, like, when they describe what they look like, they're like monsters, but when yeah. Fabius talks to them, they, like, sound really cute, like little assistant guys. Yeah, with they're, like, they're, like, childlike stuff. in the way they approach the world. Yeah. You know? they, they literally have, like, the cognizance of, like, a seven to ten-year-old, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Like, Daddy, Daddy told us to do this, and we love <laughs> Daddy. Like, oh. Yeah. Then yeah, I don't like. I don't know how that hits me. I'm not gonna lie. It feels, <laughs> it feels a bit. Uh, that's a, a well, bit it depends on how the parlance. How what parlance you use the term "daddy" with, but you know mm. we won't delve too much into that. Yeah. All right. Anyway, no, Fabius doesn't believe in stuff. <laughs> <laughs> save it. Save it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So not not all of his creations are horrid mutants, though. Oh. Uh, these early days would be the beginning of perhaps his greatest and most important creation known as the gland hounds or new men, which mm. was the result of partial gene seed implantation. So not full space Marine, but they're still hulking men and women who are part of Fabius's plan for a new age of man. And they, they can stronger. mess up Astartes. They can, if there's lots of them at least, but they are stronger, oh, yeah. faster and more keen than a regular human, but not so much as a space Marine. Uh, but this is purposeful. For unlike the Adeptus Astartes, they keep their humanity, and theirs is a far more stable version of the Gene Seed. More than this, though, uh, they are designed with the intent of hunting space marines, operating in packs and hounding Astartes, tearing them apart. They are also practiced in the act of harvesting Gene Seed, which is a skill highly desired by all legions and warbands. Fabius has a fatherly love for these creations in particular. In one moment, we even see him arrive on their level of his ship, uh, only to kneel down and outstretch his arms as the children come running towards him. He then listens to each one of them and sends them on their way. Very Aww. cute, Fabius. Mm. The greatest of the gland hounds is Igori, the mother of her generation yeah. and once leader of their tribe. So I, they do have kids, uh, we should yeah. say. They're not all, I don't think they're all Vatborn. Just in but, case you yeah. forgot the Frankenstein parallels. Yeah. 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 God. Uh, and Igori, the, the wholesomeness the wholesomeness is not coming back <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was short Igori, Igori wears a necklace of Astartes teeth uh, and was yeah. Fabius' favorite uh, mm. the most notable of the consortium is Oleander of the Emperor's Children which we talked about a little bit before yep. he was once a student of Bile uh, but had left his clutches in exiles years ago um, only to return bringing the apothecary news and now we get into spoilers for the three novels. So. I noticed them. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's this, this thing he does where, like, in the whole books, he calls him Master. And Byron's mm-hmm. like, don't call me Master. I'm not your Master mm-hmm. anymore. And he's like, no, Master. <laughs> okay, yeah. how, how about Daddy? So- <laughs> it's not far no. off. <laughs> no. oh, Oleander is a pretty cool character. But... Uh, we got to talk about Fabius. So, mm. uh, the news that he uh, brings the apothecary is that of an isolated and ripe Eldari craft world. He... Mm. <laughs> Get him. Get him. Uh, he claims a space marine, going by the name of the Radiant, was leading the attack and pleaded Bile to join. Uh, this Radiant was Casparis Telmar, an Astartes who had lived in the times of the old Legion. Oleander was chief apothecary to his war band and held position in his elite circle known as the Joy Band. So too did he desire apotheosis. Uh, the, sorry, the Radiant desired apotheosis through consuming those very tasty Eldar souls for Slanesh. Stop it. Indeed. Oh, no, no. <laughs> this is uh, a bit of a roller coaster. Though, this, was, uh, this was all part of a ploy for Oleander, though, uh, because mm. he was actually working with Harlequins in a mutual agreement of fate. More on that later. 
Go we are also it. introduced. <laughs> we are also introduced to Fabius's evil and infamous weapon, torment. And Andy can describe what? torments to us. The Rod of Torment. Um, the Rod Oof. of Torment is a demon-forged weapon, which the the we've all seen the images of um, him with like a cane, and it's got a skull and it's a shaft. The skull yeah, is yeah. from a demon prince called Shal- Shalak Clan, right? Um, and this what? Thing, <laughs> yeah, Shalak Clan. That's a bit of a, uh, a bit of a whiplash with that name. <laughs> yeah. Um, this weapon isn't like great at killing people. But it's really good at inflicting pain. Like if you just kind of like, like caressed the cane on your skin, your whole body would writhe in pain. And it's so effective at causing pain that yeah, like there's like a, a passage where Fabius is tor- torturing someone. And he's just like, blop, and they're like, ah, and he's like, uh, I barely touched you. Like calm down. And he's like, it'll get much worse. And since again it's time in the eye of terror it has been some it has become somewhat sentient just like his backpack so (laughs) it also has a mind of its own and it kind of it's almost like a feral dog fabius has to collar it and allow it to release some of its tendencies to inflict pain in order to control it because it has a mind of its own does it also have little little cane children as well no no no, no. As, I, as far as I, as far as i could tell the rod of torment has never been a mother but you know what a time it's, it's there's always time cane, though. It is. <laughs> it's a bachelor weapon of chaos I'm glad, I'm glad it finally got brought off if i knew what yep. the, the one thing i knew about awesome it sick cane. <laughs> it's time to stop when he uses it in the books it describes it uh when it touches people, it like shrieks in pleasure. Yeah. To uh, as Ew. it causes them, like yeah. the worst pain you could ever imagine, times a billion. Yeah, this whole episode is uncomfortable, yeah. dudes. Like <laughs> <laughs> the back is a great way. To I'm not gonna lie. The more I listen to it, the more it's just like, oh, he seems like, oh, he's worse. <laughs> and you're like, and, but you're a, you're a you're a um a fan of the Emperor's Children as well. You got no excuse. I, he's not really. <laughs> He's like more of a rogue. He's his own he's thing. He's the though. reason they still exist. Come on. He's, he's, he's not, re- he's he's not really. As they are him. Fabulous. He's his he's own entity. <laughs> Fabu- fabulous. You can't pick and choose your Legion. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> your Legion members. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Was that all you had to say about Torment Andy? Pretty much, yeah. It's okay. just like, it's cool. I haven't mentioned it yet. So now is a good time to talk about it. Despite all that Fabius has seen and done, he still holds true to the ideals of the Great Crusade. There are no gods. There are no demons. He sees them as nothing but hallucinations, uh, multi-dimensional personalities, and simple beings who only exist because of the belief of others. Uh, they are nothing to him, and he staunchly ignores them and denies their existence as gods. He goes as far to talk to a keeper of secrets to their face and says that they're not real. And tells that tells it that it's just a hallucination and that it's fake. Uh, he's very, he's he's what every guy on r slash atheism wish they could be. I think. <laughs> what every, yeah, every, I know every we all do. Atheists the, wish they could be. It's yeah. like the Peter Rap. I mean, he's like God's a cringe. He's just like, oh you, yeah you, keep your secrets. Come here, come here, come here. The cringe. Yeah. Oh, obvious. <laughs> Indeed. Um, but. Anywho, about Oleander and that stuff, his words would be heeded by Bile. For we must remember, even after all this time, the Blight still haunts his body. No matter how many clones he inhabits, no matter how many times he puts on new flesh, it is always there. And in Oleander's proposition, it is getting worse, yeah. In his proposition, he sees one possible solution to free himself of the agonizing process. And this is through Wraithbone and spirit stones which was the technology the eldar use to keep their spirits in a little stone call a spirit stone and they can use wraith bone to make guys like wraith guard and wraith lords which is basically a dreadnought but really fancy and the spirit stone with the guy's soul in it is just put it with the wraith bone and then it's that's the person very, basically very interesting how uh humanity hashtag could... wraith bile yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> you needed to the Eldar. Uh, well, thankfully, the lots of Elder Souls of the are going to be being consumed soon here. So, um, 
Fabius allows Oleander to plead his case to the consortium. And someone who wants to read their next quote? Uh, uh, I did the. Colin, maybe? I think I Colin did the last. Sure. Colin, why don't you read this one? Oh, if it's about this, Eleanor, boy. this is this is what call what is this what he says to the or sorry to Oleander. All right. You will present your proposition to the consortium as a whole. If some among them find merit in your proposal, then I shall take such action as I deem best. If none among the consortium are interested in your proposal, I shall break you down into raw components and forget your name. That is Damn. a raw line. Yeah. <laughs> He's awesome. He's brutal. So, in the end, as we said earlier, three other Marines agrees to the proposal. One unwillingly. Brother Samiskis of the Iron Warriors, Sikara of the Word Bears, and Aryan of the World Eaters travel with Oleander to parlay with a marine known as the Radiant King. Sikara was the unwilling, uh, as he had been captured by Bile many years ago. He was part of a Word Bears kill team, and Sikara was the only one left alive. Fabius captured him and implanted a bomb in his chest, as well as something around 100 other fail safes. Uh, Jesus. <laughs> He mm. has Sakara in his grip at all times. And they actually have very um Sakara doesn't he, he hates him, but he doesn't hate everything about him. In the third book he describes him their relationship as a whetstone and a sword. And Sakara is very pious word bear, and he will always have little mm. debates with Fabius about the gods and uh it's this fun little parallel yeah, back they and have. Forth. Well, yeah, he's in eternal servitude, and they actually caught him multiple times, like cutting open his chest to take the bomb out. And uh, he has, mm. he's almost done it a couple times, but nah, not yet. <laughs> I love that idea about like it just catches him in a corner. He's like, oh, like he's guilty. A little look on this one. Like he's eating breadcrumbs. He's <laughs> like, had the last piece of cake or something. Like, like, <laughs> when, like yeah, when like your four year old has like. Yeah. Open the jar of Nutella and is like just wolfing it down with their hands, and it's like, <laughs> but instead of Nutella, of it's a chest. bomb. And no, instead of little it guy. Hand, it's blood, and they're just like, <laughs> like a guilty look yeah. on his face. It's yeah. like, <laughs> oh, I'm so shut. You're a sheepish about it. <laughs> are you sorry because you did it, or are you sorry because you got caught? <laughs> <laughs> Fabius is like, I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> Leave the bomb in the chest now. Oh, Put it back where you found your it. Room. He's. Uh, I will say, Sakara is not actually an apothecary either. He's a demonologist, uh, mm. so he has lots of little demons and vials and stuff, and it's just it's very cool. He he helps them a lot in their journeys, but demons aren't real. Remember, Fabius said so. Good. So, yeah. The Emperor's uh, children has the demons in a jar. That can only end well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> uh, so first, this little group of guys stop at the world of Sublime, a planet which lies in between reality and unreality at all times, as it's part of the eye. They travel a path known as the Carrion Road, a warp tear, which would bring them to the planet while bypassing its outer defenses. On this incredibly dangerous path, they are boarded by demons, including the Keeper of Secrets. Fabius de defends himself against the demon and literally denies its existence, as I said before, uh, writing her off as this hallucination. It does, however, deliver a message from Fulgrim, then dies as Fabius shoots it in the eye with his needler, and a null toxin courses through it, tearing the being from the inside out. And we do see a lot that the gods seemingly have an interest in Fabius, at least at some way or another. And demons talk to him quite a lot, even though mm. Fabius will always deny it. And it's a very big part of Fabius' character that he, he kind of goes against fate. Uh, mm. He doesn't believe in fate, and he denies uh, any part that he's supposed to play in the game of reality. He makes the Harlequins a little grumpy. I think he's he's mentioned several times as being favored by the gods of the ruinous mm -hmm. powers. Like they're like, we like you, but that's. Mm. And he's like, yeah. no, cringe, uh, <laughs> don't want to go away. Indeed, there are some things revealed to him later on, but uh, eventually they make planetfall upon the gunship known as Butcher Bird, Fabius's personal semi sentient transport. It's very very awesome machine, and it's just like this bloodthirsty. Uh, like Thunderhawk type of gunship. I don't know what the exact gunship is, but it said that uh, when people go out of it, they have to give it a wide berth because if it gets grumpy, it'll just kill them. 
if it's within its guns range. But what what is yeah. going, bro? He's got a sentient backpack, a, pi- a sentient pimp cane, and a sentient thunderbird. Indeed. Like too many too many Indeed. things have got opinions. He's got a drum. He's got a grumpy stormbird or something. He like that. <laughs> he's so he grumpy. Knows, not sentient. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's got a malevolent teacup and if you put the wrong kind of liquids in it if you put like you know like you put babies in, in it just yeah. it spits it at you in your eyes the yeah. non-sentient yeah. poop knife <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> oh i forgot that that exists okay okay so at the uh, at the planet of sublime <laughs> They they go to Mark and they do a bunch of stuff, but they capture most importantly they capture a corsair, which was their main goal because they need something to help them get to Luganoth, the craft world. Uh, but they do battle a troop of harlequins while they're trying to get them. Oleander speaks with the shadow spear, shadow seer, sorry, frustrated at their intervention. But the seer reveals uh, they know of the radiance intentions and that it, this is all part of the plan or the performance as they say. They deem Fabius as the king of feathers and seem to say that he will unite the legion once again. Oleander gives them Kasparos and they give him a new bile. Kasparos is the reigning king. Uh, yeah. They would also meet an individual known as Mordrek, just a fun little guy in the lore, I guess. Uh, he was the reason Fabius wanted to take the carry on road to bypass the defenses so he didn't know that they were there but he finds them anyways. Uh, This space marine was lord of the planet and had been blessed, or in his case, cursed with immortality. Butcher Bird would blow him to bits before they would leave, yet he would eventually reform. Bile reveals the reason for the hatred given to him by Mordrek was not simply due to the tormentous uh, experiments he performed upon the man, but because he failed to kill him. So, next, we see... Uh, another creation of Bile upon his ship while he has the captured Eldari. And this creation is known as the Mind Worm. It, uh, he uses this centipede-like device to extract information from their captured Eldar's mind. It copies the host's mind completely, compiling their thoughts, dreams, and more. I can only think of like this, the little robot in Star Wars well, there, in episode two, a... you know? Ooh. I remember when I heard this, it reminded me of there's, I think it's the path of heaven, there's a white scar being uh, tortured by Mortarian, and he uses a similar thing where it, like, it burrows into his isn't skull. It? Yeah, mm. and I remember thinking, like, mm, I've heard something similar before, but it's, like, a mm. bit, a slightly bit less cruel. Yeah. <laughs> but only slightly. I mean, yeah. Cause, and, I mean, it is a good invention, because space marines can eat brains to gain their knowledge, yeah. uh, but this is very wasteful in Fabius's eyes. And this way, he can retain the information for whenever he needs it and compile it on, like, as data. Uh, yeah. And this is how they find the route to the craft world of Luganeth. With this complete, they arrive at the Radiant King's flagship, and Fabius would ask for an alliance with Kasparos. Oleander had told a small lie previously that the Radiant King had ordered him to speak with Fabius, but nonetheless, Bile wins the Legionary over with the promise of souls. He takes brain matter from multiple captured psychers and combines it with graphs from the captured Eldar. Together, uh, he creates the psychic organs required to mask the fleet from the craft world until it is too late for the Xenos. Uh, He needs a host, though, and a tough one at that. So he takes a noise marine from the Radiant ship and uh, and using their modified physiology implants one named Alien, or Alien, Kind of a weird name. Uh, yeah. Who had originally been one of Bile's original cacophoni. Uh, in mm. an arduous and slimy process, the consortium successfully completes the surgery and has him linked to the ship. This Yuck. would work extremely well. And the combined forces... So I guess I should say this a little more. The psychic implant that they give to him, uh, it basically it, it makes him able to mask the ship. Like take so away the they think it's Eldari. Completely. Yeah. And but it's like so such an incredibly arduous task that they need someone very very tough. And noise marines are very very tough. As they're uh, well, you know, they're crazy. They handle they a lot of vibrations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it does vibrations. work. They play a lot of guitar here, right? Those guys. Yes, Ooh. they do. A lot of uh, I love noise marines. Um, <laughs> but they they approach the craft world and they attack them before they can suitably react. Within Butcher Bird, Fabius descends with his consortium and his gland hounds and a group of Astartes from the Radiance forces. Uh, he quickly reaches his objective, that of a Wraithbone Garden, 
but before he can gain his prize, the Shadow Seer and her Harlequins manifest and attack. During a duel with the Seer, Fabius is shown thousands of possible futures with only one option for survival. He must take on the mantle of command if he wished to persevere. If he did not, he would die. Whether from an enemy or the blight, he would perish. But by sheer force of will and the Keeper of Secrets, Bile's retinue would survive the attack and his prize of Wraithbone would be claimed. The Radiant would begin the ascension to demonhood, but would be slain by the Harlequins. He still got to eat lots of tasty souls, though, don't worry. Um, before escaping onto Butcher Bird, Samiskis would sacrifice himself to save Oleander. Speaking the first and only word you ever hear him say, as he lay dying, he speaks the word brother. A word not Aww. spoken truly by any of the Chaos Space Marines in these dark days. It was a glimmer of hope for their future. The Harlequins would speak to Fabius and Oleander again right before they leave, though, and their ploy is revealed. In a very tragic moment for the Third Legion, Bile rejects the words of both Oleander and the Xenos, claiming they simply want to clamp him down to the Legion, bringing him the great burden of responsibility and taking him off the path of his important work. Staying true to himself, the Primogenitor changes fate and goes off script, something that deeply disturbs the Harlequins of the Laughing God. Mm. They withdraw, but Fabius leaves Oleander behind for his betrayal, not executing him only because of his past service. He takes possession of the Radiance Cruiser and leaves. This is not the end of the Harlequins, though, and it is not the end of Oleander. Uh, for the Harlequins will continue to haunt the edges of Fabius' reality. Mm. For Damn. a few centuries, Fabius continues his research and wards off predators within the Eye until much of his lackeys decide on a revolt. They assault the Versalius, Fabius' flagship. Uh, and at the time of the revolt, Bile is undergoing a transference. Um, uh, which, as we said, Korag was helping with. So Arian is left in command to subdue the traitors. Together, the World Eater leading the Consortium and Glanhound successfully ward off the Rebellion for a time. But this is a very stark reminder to Fabius of his ever-creeping mortality. The Cacophoni also remain loyal to the Spider, and Fabius resumes command once the Cerebral Transference is complete. He promises an ancient hero of the chapter, Dreadnought Deomat, with blessed death, gaining his aid, and the uprising is crushed. Bile then leads his warband to a dead craft world using his new project. And by the way, he gets, I think he gets to this craft world largely using a webway portal. He slowly starts learning about the webway and mapping it out. Uh, that gets bigger later, though. Unfortunately for Colin, does he doesn't want them anywhere near the Eldari, does he? <laughs> uh, but his biggest project at the time was a Wraithbone Garden, uh, which was grown after Luganeth, of course. And in its midst, since the Eldar Corsair they had once captured all those centuries ago, but he's no longer an Eldar Corsair. He is now named Key, and has acted as a psychic conductor for Fabius. The Wraithbone has grown around and inside of the poor Eldar. But oh, he's, it seems to... It's hard to describe. He's, like, he not, he's not the same thing he once was. And he seemingly... He, him and the Noise Marines actually hang out in the Wraith Garden. And they all like sing their song. And the Wraithbone kind of resonates their like, debauchery. Tune. Song. That yeah, is, it's very that is odd. bizarre. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My God. Indeed. So, upon this dead craft world, they plunder what they can, but are ambushed again by Harlequins because they just won't leave them alone. Uh, and also, Corsairs of the Sunbliss Brotherhood, which was the group Key had hailed from. After a desperate battle, they are rescued, uh, if you can call it that, by Lord Commander Eidolon's forces. <laughs> so, these books are awesome because you get to see the Emperor's Children character finally. But hmm. uh, other than Lucius, I guess, because he has a book. But this detachment is led by a Marine named Flavius. Flavius, a very Emperor's children -y name, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they have frosted tips. <laughs> I, I like he serves with the Phoenix Guard. Um, they have to surrender to him and are escorted to the broken world of harmony because the world still exists even after the eight megaton explosion. Right. Still. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he confronts Eidolon, who informs Fabius of a message he also received from Fulgrim. 
Uh, this was delivered through Melisandre, Fabius' flesh and blood creation, who was actually made from his literal flesh and blood. So she's, she's like literally his daughter, which is neat. Um, but unfortunately for Fabius, she was taken by Fulgrim a long time ago and is now basically like a demonic entity. Well, she is a demonic entity, but she kind of haunts a lot of the gland hounds. As she talks to Eidolon, obviously. In the third book, she talks a lot to Oleander and becomes very active. Talking to Fabius as well, trying to get him to meet up with Fulgrim. These guys really want them to get back together. But Fabius just never has any of it, unfortunately. Oh. He's getting um, hounded, man. Like, yeah. Yeah. Everyone wants yeah. a piece of Fabius in the books. Seriously. They're all mm. after him. Like he's, just, he's just in the corner, like, leave me alone. And everyone's like, but, but the experiments. <laughs> so... The message uh, for, from Fulgrim was a gathering of might, a reunion of the great and powerful lords and rulers of the Third Legion. But he must undergo a test, and a powerful demonic mutant emerges who frees his time and shows Fabius the face and depth of the gods. So he, like, in a sense, he literally sees Slanesh. Mm. It, at least how it's described is how I think it happened. But Bile doesn't care. He denies what he sees, and the demon resumes time. <laughs> I've been given this opportunity. He's like, ah, I don't care. It's cringe. <laughs> it's uh, kind of like yeah. someone. It's like someone going like being shown like a piece of art and just being like, nah, it doesn't look nice. I just don't. <laughs> yeah, just like, no like, like, imagine if someone was just like, hey, look, here is literally God's face. What do you think? He's like, <laughs> take it or leave it. Like, really? <laughs> okay. Six uh, out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The demon wouldn't, does wouldn't recommend. Though, um, the demon does, though, kind of, I think it was this demon. It was a demon at some point, though. He reveals, or at least implies, that the reason the flesh blight exists is, like, almost because of the chaos gods, sort of. He, he, he seems to try to tell Fabius that he's very intertwined with Slanesh and the gods, and that the reason for a lot of his things is because of them. Fabius doesn't care, still. Uh, as acting, oh, sorry, and the, the, the demon deems him not guilty, which is what was the main purpose of the test was to find a punishment for him. Uh, and Eidolon and all of his buddies are around and they get very unhappy about this, but Eidolon lets him go anyways. I'm trying to stitch him up. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Commander Eidolon tells him he needs to undergo a task to completely prove himself, kind of, and also just to do his duty. And this was to find the lost gene tithe that we talked about a long time ago. So as chief apothecary, it was his duty to retrieve this. In return, Eidolon would give him the protection of the third legion from all enemies, including Abaddon. He agrees and is then permitted to enter his old laboratory. While it was almost completely destroyed and scavenged, a small sect of mutants descending from his past assistants would praise his return. So they've survived all these millennia, which is really neat. They would lead him to two underground machinery that had kept intact all of his so that has been kept intact for all this time. Uh, Twenty vats with one very important unit remaining in pristine condition. This vat contains none other than Fulgrim, the perfect clone. Ooh. He smuggles indeed, he smuggles the remnants of his work back onto the Versalius, and they depart for the gene tithe. As they travel, the clone ages quickly and is tossed by Fabius. The most important part about this Fulgrim is that he goes uncorrupted, truly perfect, what the Phoenician was meant to be. He keeps him isolated, he keeps him as isolated as possible, allowing him large amounts of study material and giving him some semblance of a father. Yeah, uh, he's, he's actually not, pretty good at the fathering thing compared to Biggie. Is. I'm, like, I'm a loyalist simp and I'm like, yeah, he was a good dad in some regards. Indeed. Um, no, despite we're... the flesh coat. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, the Emperor is more of a soldier. Than a, I was yeah. saying, more of a leader politician than yeah. a father. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but he can't keep a literal Primark contained forever, of course. And Fulgrim would sneak around the ship and absor observe uh, much as it happened around him. Uh, he would also feel a real connection with the past life of the actual Fulgrim, seeing his memories and experiences. He was disgusted by them. Not only this, but the narrative almost suggests that despite being a clone, he has a soul and a true soul of Fulgrim at that. Hmm. But this, this is, is big, a poor interpretation. 
there's this big struggle in the book where he's like he remembers everything Fulgrim did and he like even regrets like the death of Ferris Manus and he's like I'll mm-hmm. never be like him and it's like that's you he's like no that was the other Fulgrim I'm like the proper mm-hmm. one and he goes through this whole thing of like Fabius trying to teach him and him trying to go against his nature and it's really interesting like hearing the the like adolescent Fulgrim struggling with it he doesn't want to hang out in his room. I don't want to go to my room. I want to go out there. He's, he's like Ariel from the Middle, Little Mermaid, but with better hair. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, as he watches Fulgrim learn and grow, he sees in him an actual hope, something that Fabius had not believed in for a very long time. He saw the possibility of a new legion, a force led by pure and untainted being. So this is kind of going back to the time of when he's making Horus, but this is even more promising. Uh, The true phoenix, resplendent in true, clean beauty, untouched by the debauchery and insanity of the Dark Prince. For the time being, though, Bile would arrive at the planet which contained the precious gene seed and would descend upon it with his retinue. He left many of the gland hounds and space marines behind, anticipating the betrayal that awaited him on the Versalius. This betrayal was expected from a marine known as Alkanex, uh, who was not of Bile's warband. He was hmm. just, I think he was one of Eidolon's guys, if I remember correctly. Um, that, yeah. So, Igori was tasked with watching over Fulgrim, uh, and the Primarch was, of course, ordered to remain in his quarters. Fabius would indeed return to a betrayal, but not the one he expected. They would quickly discover the planet was a tomb world. Uh, not just any tomb worlds, though, this was Solumnus home to a very important figure within the Necrons. A trap was sprung, and the forces of Chaos would be ambushed by the metallic defenders of Solemnus. So too would the marines loyal to Alkanex attempt at assassinating Fabius until the apothecary and ancient Deomat fell into a large crevice. So, sorry, Alkanex was on the ship, and his lackeys were on the ground, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so Bile then fulfills his promise to the old warrior and ends his life. It's a little sad... I don't know, but sad, but it's compassionate of Fabius. So, uh, the truth of the matter is then revealed as a being walks out from the depths of the planet. As he approaches the chief apothecary, Trazen the Infinite reveals himself. Yeah. Really, yeah. Oh, boy. He, he originally wishes to add Bile to his collection, but is eventually swayed by Fabius as they make a deal. Negotiations go awry for Bile, though, but he is rescued by none other than the Harlequins. Here, the Shadowseer Vale Walker would tell Fabius she was there to save him from captivity, but Bile offers the Harlequins to Trazen uh, as they show up. Damn. So, <laughs> yes. And now he has trapped the Aldari, and many swiftly fell as the scarabs and warriors emerged from all around them. Vale Walker would escape, but the remaining troop did not. In exchange for these Xenos, the Infinite allowed Bile safe passage. But in another deal, Fabius would provide Trazen with one of his own clones and basically a copy of his brain in exchange for the Lost Gene Tithe and the Necrons' assistance in keeping the Versalius. Meanwhile, on the Versalius, Alkanex and his soldiers would raid Bile's laboratory and begin raising it. Igori would take Fulgrim to safe hiding, where he would rally the packs of Glandhounds. They would place upon him crude armor, and he would heft a large piece of metal as his sword. All traitors fell before Fulgrim, either by his hand or simply to their knees as an undeniable authority washed over them. Merix, one of the old Joybound, would literally stop in his tracks as he was about to kill Igori, the voice of his Primarch commanding him. For all intents and purposes, it was literally Fulgrim. And at the climax of the battle, Alkanex would fire a shot at his clone father before realizing what it was. Igori would leap in front of the Phoenician, saving him and proving her loyalty to the new creation. Even after this, Alkanex would kneel before Fulgrim as his new lord. Fabius and Trazen would then appear back upon the ship, and despite Fulgrim's victory and perfection, Fabius was not pleased. He saw his new men and an army of Emperor's children kneeling before the Risen Phoenix, a new hope for the Legion, a redeeming chance. This was their one shot at redemption, their one shot at escaping the clutches of the Dark Prince, the only way for them to become what they had once been. But none of this mattered to the Primogenitor. 
All he saw was servitude amongst his new men, that were created to one day rule themselves. He saw the glimpse of arrogance upon Fulgrim's face that had been part of his father's downfall. This was not part of his plan, and it truly drove the point home that Fabius lost all care for his legion a long, long time ago. He turned to Trazen and altered the deal. In exchange for the gene tithe, he would give the Necron Fulgrim. Legionaries rose to defend their clone father, but Trazen would simply freeze time, take the Primarch and the Marines, and leave. And that was it. It was like the saddest, as an Emperor's Children fan, it was the saddest moment. Mm. In the last so, 10,000 so years. Yeah, it was so, they were that, so it was close. redeeming themselves. We're literally on the cusp of something so awesome and great, mm. but Fabius had none of it. And I like the, uh, I love the part where they, like, these are men who are like, these are Marines who are actually corrupted by chaos. Mm-hmm. And yet, still, when they see the Primarch Fulgrim, they literally just start weeping. Yeah. And, and they prove the they, presence like, of Fulgrim. They go, "Oh, we'll do what he wants," and it's like, mm-hmm. "Oh, yeah, it was like, that easy?" I can defy chaos. Like crazy. Yeah, uh, Igor is healed by Fabius, but she leaves with her um, pack as she feels like she's failed him. I think uh, Fabius actually doesn't understand why she leaves, but he lets her. Jesus. Uh, we see Vale walk. Sorry, we see Vale Walker one last time in this portion, and she reveals to Fabius. That one story is coming to an end, but a new one is beginning. She gives the spider a gift, a map of the webway, showing the path to the dark city of Kamara. They're too nice for these people. (laughs) (laughs) To be fair, directing someone to Kamara is a great way to get them killed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pardon me. Wish they were killed. Indeed. Mm. Indeed. So in recent times, Fabius actually travels to Kamara and studies under the tutelage of the homunculus Covens. But we will explore this in the future. His lore is ever expanding and growing, so there may even be a part two at some point in time. Ooh. I hope you have all enjoyed this episode of Lore Crimes. Uh, I hope you all like Fabius as a character. He's very interesting and very uh, peculiar. He's unique. He's done a lot. Sick. Like, he's done a lot. I guess if I could have any, go ahead. any questions, I think uh, my big question is, damn, <laughs> <It's just laughs> how is he? I think I can see how uh, jaded he's become over time because mm-hmm. it's just, you know, he obviously he probably hasn't, with the warp stuff, he hasn't necessarily lived 10,000 years, but it feels like he's just, like it's a never-ending journey, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. He's, he's very probably... accomplished individual. Yeah, so I mean, can, can you can you think of anyone else who's, not only like in there at the beginning of their legion, survived the Horus heresy, cloned Primarchs, and done it's like he's done a lot. Like yeah. he he seems like a side character, but he's like one of the top ten most yeah. important with like, he's like literally a main character. Yeah, when you see all the stuff he's done that's changed everything in the universe. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there's many other characters that have as much lore as him. Maybe like Ragnar mm-hmm. Blackmane, because he has like five books or something, but six. Yeah, I, I went through that pain. And then, <laughs> and then I assume Ragnar's stuff is just him, like, exploring, going on. He's adventures, having an adventure. Stuff, right? adventure. Like, yeah. Where Tire, Fabius is, like, actually accomplishing things, Mjord. right? <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. he's doing Mjord Festival. He's like, this yeah. one's quite bitter. Yeah. This one's Fabius quite is just sweet. very, Fabius is very peculiar, though, because he has the adventures and kills lots of stuff, like any other space marine. But he's like mm. a scientist, and he has breakthroughs all the time, and he's constantly researching and getting new discoveries and creating new things which is something and that his, we don't really see and his discoveries changed the course of the galaxy like just horus Indeed. like he cloned horus he basically birthed the black legion because of what he did like oof mm-hmm. i think his story is okay. also very grim darky because there's a little there's an undertone of like it's a little bit sad if you know what i mean it's like a, it's a lot of like epic but it's a lot of oh you know what i mean like he's, he's yeah. like oh it's been Dad to clone Fulgrim. Oh, clone Fulgrim is now imprisoned, and he doesn't want to do it, but he has to. Oh. Yeah, especially because if yeah. you look at his, like, if you look at his goals in a vacuum, it's like they're almost noble. And then you look at what he's mm-hmm. actually doing, it's like, oh. And then you remember Yuck. he's wearing a skin jacket. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he has the backpack. I like the backpack part, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the eggs. That'll be I a think, short, I'm sure. You've heard of a flashlight. Uh, <laughs> get ready for full coat. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, oh yeah uh thank you thank you very much eli for helming that let's just say 
that absolute huge task of doing mm. Fabius Bile justice. Ooh. It's a Thank lot. You. That's a lot to cover. And even more. A lot more than I thought. When we explore uh, Comoran, and the Dark City, we'll hopefully have a yes. little dabble of uh, Fabius mm. in the future. Mm. And uh, for our next episode, it will be, again, we're returning to the timeline. So we'll be doing the birth of the Imperium. So essentially we're following uh, humans this time. Uh, sorry, Colin, mm. no more Eldari uh, for a little <laughs> while. And uh, so I hope you... I get to do what Andy did next time and sit there naysaying everything they do. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Pain. Uh, thank you all so much for listening and uh, watching. Hope you all enjoyed it. Hope you all uh, think you have an expert level. I'm pretty sure we can all leave with an expert level mm. of knowledge <laughs> on the Fabius Bile. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you very Bye, much. Everyone. Peace. Bye. Farewell. Bye.